and we realize that we have a massive content gap and a massive SEO visibility gap between ourselves and our competitors, some of which have been a lot more established, right? Have been around for like six, eight years. So no wonder. But with that being our main acquisition channel, we felt like we should speed up in order to at least catch up to some extent, right? So what's the only way you, you can you know, catch up with someone's like six or eight years worth of publishing content once per week? Hello, everyone, and welcome to another episode of SaaS SEO. So I'm your host, Oskar Sjodis, and today I'm very happy to be joined by Emilia Korczynska. Emilia is the head of marketing at UserPilot and a product marketing enthusiast. She has experience of working with several SaaS businesses as a marketer and a co-founder. Her passion for con marketing, SEO, and SaaS products led her to build UserPilot's whole content operations, hiring system, and documentation from the ground up. Emilia, welcome to the show. Thank you so much for inviting me, George. It's my so, pleasure. So the pleasure is mine. Uh, <laughs> so before we begin, and I have many interesting things that I'd like to discuss with you today. Um, can you please share a few things about your background? Uh, what has brought you to where you are today? Right. So it was a really long and winding path, I would say. Um, I didn't in initially plan to be a SaaS marketer, although I've always loved writing. I initially wanted to be a journalist and I worked as a journalist for a few years. Then I kind of um, diverted into my own business, which was initially a translations agency. But then after a few years, um, my clients started coming with more and more marketing related requests. It was around the time when content marketing was becoming a buzzword. So people wanted to localize their websites, localize their SaaS products, and they wanted to localize their content and ultimately questions around creating content started popping up. So you know, I started creating content. It was, it was a nice um, change and I really felt like I'm in my element. So um, that happened and I started working with a bunch of SaaS businesses. That was early 2016, roughly. Um, and, you know, I liked the business model, SaaS business model so much. I was like pretty much enchanted and I thought like, oh my gosh, agencies are so difficult to scale, right? Um, there are so many moving parts and this is such a great business model. Like you can scale your digital products in infinitely very much. Which is pretty naive of me at that time. But anyway, I decided to build my own SaaS product with um, a co-founder that was in, in China and that was basically an app, uh, location business customer app for um, expats in China, which was listing different venues, um, services and events on a um, bilingual map. So, you know, people could get around <laughs> without Google Maps. Um, that, I mean, we built the product and we shipped the product, which is something I was, I was proud of, but it didn't really take off the way we expected, mostly because of the business model. Ultimately, I decided to sell my shares and go back to Europe, uh, just in time before COVID. <laughs> um, but I was already really hooked on working in SaaS um, and I found another small SaaS startup um, in Poland to join. That was post fitty and you know a few i guess that was around a year a year and a half into or maybe less maybe like six months into working with post fitty i met azar so the former head of growth at user pilot at conference we exchanged contacts started sort of doing some collaborations marketing collaborations together for our respective companies and then several months later he asked me if i would like to join them part-time I thought that would be another SaaS gig, but that, you know, escalated quickly. So here I am heading the marketing department now a few years later. Okay. That, that's all very, very interesting. Um, and I would like to, to know about now, uh, you are heading the, the marketing efforts at uh, user pilot. First of all, for people who don't know what is user pilot and, um, who gets the most value out of the product? Mm -hmm. 
So basically, user pilot is a product growth platform. So we serve product managers, product marketing managers, broadly speaking, product teams that want to communicate with their users and engage their users in app. So the most common use case is user onboarding, right? User pilot allows you to build your user onboarding experiences without any code. So just have this visual editor that looks a bit like Canva in a Chrome extension, and you click and point to elements on your screen and build experiences around them. So you can walk your users around, and there are a couple more smaller products like um, in-app surveys or a resource center, which allows you to provide self-serve support. So it's a pretty complex B2B product. It's easy to use, but it's um, not always easy to understand unless you are you know, a product person and you understand the importance of product-led growth. Well, I can see a PLG uh, baseball hat behind you, so you probably do. Um, yeah. yeah. Okay, that's, uh, that's, that's interesting. Thanks for, thanks for sharing that. Um, now, one of the reasons why I wanted to, to have you on the show is because I've been following you for a while now. And um, I've been following specifically, uh, you know, the, the story about how you, you manage to scale uh, your, your content operations uh, at UserPilot. Mm -hmm. And to begin with, I would like to know uh, what did your content strategy look like back in, I guess, 2021 before uh, you decide to, you know, scale up your, your cond operations? How were things back then? Yeah, so that we needed to take a few steps back even like um, a bit earlier, like I would say 2020, I joined UserPilot at the very beginning of 2020. And that point, it was a very small company, very small startup. And um, we were at the phase of throwing spaghetti to the wall. Um, and it took us a very long time <laughs> that we were throwing spaghetti to the wall and not seeing what stuck, right? And so we're experimenting with a lot of different channels, a lot of different types of content as well. So Aza, who, you know, at that point was heading um, the content strategy, recognized the need for um, SEO content on our blog early, which was great. So he created uh, several bottom of the funnel um, SEO posts, for instance, alternative posts, comparing user pilots to our alternatives, et cetera, et cetera, right? Um, and uh, hired a freelance content writer who was writing one blog post a week. But on top of that, we were creating webinars, we were doing partnerships, building backlinks, um, going to conferences, you know, whatever channel and tactic there is in marketing, we've tried it. So the results weren't as good as they could have been if we focused, especially, you know, at that point with a team of two and one freelancer. Um, it wasn't a great idea to spread ourselves so thinly. Or maybe even it was to get some initial traction, right? Um, but it got to the point where we, you know, morphed from a very small startup into like a 30-person company, right? Where we already had the resources and where, you know, such a random way of leading the marketing department wasn't serving us anymore because um, we didn't really have a fixed content plan, right? And more like, we had a few keywords, right, that seemed like they made sense because they were related to our product and the audience. Um, but it was still very spontaneous, I would say, right? Um, so towards the end of 2020, we felt like basically we have some kind of a blind spot. We don't know how to uh, move from this very scrappy startup way of running the marketing department into, you know, like a more mature way of running it. So we hired um, a fractional VP of marketing who had experience with scaling a fairly similar B2B product from like two and a half to eleven and a half million dollars in just two years. He had a successful exit and kind of became our mentor. He looked at our data and surprise, surprise, he said, like, why don't you guys focus on what's already working? And we're like, what? Well, 60, 70% of your leads come from your blog. 
Like, why are you doing all these different things like email courses, right? This and that and that and webinars and whatnot. And at first we were a bit defensive because we were like, oh, but we need to build funnels and we need to nurture, right? Um, people who come to the blog. And he was like, no, you don't. <laughs> Um, and because he had so much more experience than we did and he had a proof of concept, we decided to just give it a go and trust him and um, just follow his advice, create a content plan that would allow us to catch up with our competitors, right? Um, so, yeah, well, we decided to do it and see after like three to six months how that affects our um, results, basically. Um, yeah. So when you, when you did, when you did that, like, it, was there a specific that, you know, we have to publish a certain number of pieces per month? Uh, what was the, uh, the decision back then and the thinking, uh, yeah. you know, behind this decision? Yeah. So the decision was based on our content audit and based on competitive gap analysis. So basically the functionality in Ahrefs or SEMrush, right? Um, so our mentor was using SEMrush, we were using Ahrefs and we kind of cross-referenced the data. Um, we had a look at, you know, the, the head terms we are ranking for or we are not ranking for. Um, and we realized that we have a massive content gap and massive SEO visibility gap between ourselves and our competitors, some of which have been a lot more established, right? Have been around for like six, eight years. So no wonder. But with that being our main acquisition channel, we felt like we should speed up in order to at least catch up to some extent, right? So what's the only way you, you can you know, catch up with someone's like six or eight years worth of publishing content once per week? You need to publish content, say, six times or eight times per week, right, in order to, to basically, to some extent, it, it close the gap. Um, so that was the rationale behind our decision. If we're going, you know, on full speed with content, we need to increase content velocity. So basically the rate at which we are publishing content to, you know, even get through the, the basic list that we came up with from the content gap analysis. Okay, that makes sense. I remember in one of your Facebook posts, I think it was from last year, you mentioned that you had to, you know, during this process, you had to go through um, a few different service providers, like I'm assuming freelancers, agencies, or something like that, yeah. to find a way to produce good content at scale. Can you please share more with us on these experiences and, you know, what they have taught you um, that um, ideally and hopefully other SaaS companies will, you know, pay attention to and uh, will not go through. Yeah, that's a brilliant question, really. Um, this is what led us to ultimately develop the system. I'll talk about um, in more detail a bit later, but essentially we thought that after having this list of, you know, keywords um, in a spreadsheet, a list of topics, we can just dump that on a freelancer or on an agency and go, right? And they will do the research, produce great content for us, and we'll just keep plopping it onto our blog and everybody will be happy. That, of course, is not the case. We learned very quickly. Um, so the freelancer we were working with, he actually resigned around the time when we decided to go full speed with, with our content output. He was a bit of an exception to the rule because he was actually interested in SaaS, interested in product. And um, he's been with us for a while, so he was, he was very good, right? But that's maybe 1% of all writers out there. And so when we started looking for freelance writers and when we tried out a few agencies, it clearly, it quickly transpired that they don't have enough um, information about our industry, our target persona, our product in order to create this content and to do the research independently, right? So the way how we arranged our content plan was basically from, you know, the highest intent posts, so bottom of the final posts to the lowest intent posts, top of the final posts. So, you know, what all these bottom of the final pieces have in common is that they are very, very specialist. They involve and entail 
like very you know detailed intimate knowledge of our product which obviously a freelance writer that has never used it wouldn't have so that was the first clash with reality and um, so then we came up with a brilliant also brilliant brilliant in parentheses <laughs> inverted commas idea to hire a bunch of full-time writers and invest a lot of time and effort into training them in the product um, and that backfired badly as well uh, so yeah so we spent a, a lot of time around three months just looking for writers who showed potential and had experience in SaaS ideally had experience in product because product management is like a very very niche um, topic that few people understand because um, our audience is so sophisticated right and um, they, they would you know smell from miles if somebody's writing about something they don't know what they are talking about and um, we managed to find such people ironically in our networks and we managed to convince them to write for us and they did for a very short while before burning out right and saying hey you know what i'm actually a product manager i don't want to be hammering out for SEO blog posts and pretty much the same topic with like different variations of the keyword per week was like below me, right? So three out of four um, content writers that I hired at the beginning that were supposed to be our core, you know, content team have left in the first three months. And then I went back to the drawing board and a little cry. <laughs> So uh, I was basically left with a um, growth manager who was responsible for Google ads and more like technical SEO aspects of our execution. And I was left with one writer. So what do you do? <laughs> yeah, and this is when I started thinking about systems, right? And I realized that we approached um, execution of this plan in a very wrong way, right? So relying on people and relying on talent to figure it out themselves okay that's all very very interesting to me by the way many many inter very interesting learnings uh, there and insights so you've experienced all these things and now we are talking about systems we've identified that you know what the system must be the the problem mm -hmm. what changed and you know what were the exact steps that you that you took from there onward from then onwards to start changing the um, the situation and focusing more on system than on you know people. Yeah, yeah, exactly. So you know, um, after like our writers resigned, they kind of resigned in bunches. So it all exploded in my face. Uh, I took around a week or ten days to just talk to content managers from both like in-house teams and other SaaS companies and in agencies to like figure out what they were doing. Um, they had a lot of good ideas, right? But I didn't have find like one single sort of blueprint to follow yet at that point. And I was beating myself up a bit and then suddenly one night, um, you know, like it all fell into pieces. I realized that, well, I could borrow um, the way that the product team is actually um, arranging their, you know, shipping features and um, organizing product development. So I decided we need to divide the content plan into epics, right? So basically content clusters, which is not particularly ingenious. It's like the HubSpot's content cluster, you know, strategy where you have one content hub, right? And basically um, supporting blog content uh, around it. So we identified um, 10 topics, right, um, that we want to create content around that was related to the different problems that user pilot is solving, the different metrics it improves, right, the different roles it serves. Um, and then after dividing, you know, the, the spreadsheet, the massive spreadsheet that we had from the keyword research into these content clusters, we created a Kanban board on Asana, right? And each um, content cluster became an epic with the separate blog posts arranged by intent as the first sort and then by search volume as the secondary sort, right? So we basically went after the topics that had the highest opportunity to convert and the highest opportunity to attract 
most people. Um, so these became subtasks in Asana, right? Which were then added as individual tasks to a to-do column, right? So basically I divided the Kanban board into like five sections to do in progress writing, editing, um, proofreading, and then publishing, right? Um, so then I realized I actually took a leaf this time out of John Bonini's playbook. Um, he's the CMO of, um, not Data Studio, no, we're Databox? actually using their data box, we're using their product as well, but um, like always thinking of Google Data Studio first. Um, so yeah, I took a leaf out of John Bonini's book and also a couple more people told me that we need an editor, right? So um, I basically promoted our only remaining writer to a content editor role. And that person together with me initially um, was responsible for creating all the content briefs for you know, all the topics. So we divided the epics between ourselves, right? She got five, I got five, right? Um, so that meant we had to produce one brief per week, right? Uh, sorry, one brief per day, right, each. Um, and then we would pass them on in Asana to the respective writers that would then, then that would then uh, basically write the content based on um, the very, very detailed brief. So what changed was that instead of relying on writers to become like really um, sophisticated and really knowledgeable about a particular topic, we just had like two editors who you know, provided super, super detailed briefs with like all the H2s, all the H3s, all the talking points, all the images, all the internal and outbound links that they needed to include in bullet points. So it became like a paint by number um, blueprint for the writers. We had only one writer per epic. So each writer had to produce only one blog post per week, which gave them plenty of time to, you know, familiarize themselves with the brief and um, you know, do some extra research if they needed to. And um, we also provided them with self-serve resources to learn about user pilot and you know, the target audience, but that became secondary now that they didn't need to do all the research themselves. Um, and finally, the difference was that, well, with 10 epics, we could produce two pieces of content basically every day. So with 10 epics, 10 different writers, only one post per week per writer. That meant that um, you know, the epics had specific delivery dates uh, per week. It's a bit like with lacing your shoes, what I'm talking about is a lot more complicated to describe than to see and implement actually. But essentially we assigned a day of the week to each epic. So that was the due date for the writers. So we knew that, say, on Monday, we are publishing blogs about product adoption and user engagement. On Tuesday, we are publishing blogs about product marketing management and retention. So it became very, very organized, right? We knew exactly what's coming, what's in the pipeline, at which stage um, the writers are with different topics. Um, so that was, that was super helpful. Um, and yeah, introducing the editor's role also meant that we could scale this very quickly without losing the quality. So the editor, we developed brief templates that sped up the work of the editors as well and allowed us to ultimately hire freelance editors as well or promote the writers to freelance editors if we wanted to scale it further. Now, currently, we don't really. Um, and, you know, like basically the editor after receiving the post back from the writer would check everything against the brief. So we estimated actually how much time we were saving on this. So previously, our full-time writers, when they just got the keyword and they had to come up with absolutely everything, would spend between 10 and 20 hours on writing, you know, a blog post of around 2,500 words which is fair if you consider, you know, they had to go into different apps, take screenshots of the products, et cetera, et cetera, and learn about the topic. And um, now it took the editor between one and two hours to create the brief and the writer between four and six hours to write it. So we would say, you know, um, between like four and 12 hours on every blog post. 
Um, of course, you know, writers are not paid by the hour, but yeah, <laughs> that sort yeah. of gives you a bigger picture of, of how much more efficient the system was. That's all very, very, very interesting. It's, it's, it's a brilliant system. And also the way that you broke them down and uh, you assigned the writer to its, uh, I guess, topical category and you, you maintain mm -hmm. that schedule. It's, it's, it's really actually brilliant. I'd like to know how your kind operations look like today. Do you maintain the same um, system? Do you improve it? Do you see it, you know, going any further? Uh, what, what, you know, um, your kind operations look like today? Yeah, so of course, you know, it's evolved over time. And then since we added a proofreader at the end of the food chain, so someone who gives the content a final check, and pushes it through Story Chief to our blog and all the distribution platforms we want to distribute the content to, so mainly medium and social media. Um, we also added Surfer SEO, right, as our primary writing platform, and that has had a big impact on um, the performance of our content. We have gradually built out um, basically tracking systems in Google Data Studio to monitor basically how each piece of content is performing, um, which piece of content is decaying, right? So in terms of that, that's another big learning that you can't lose sight um, of, you know, your old content. You need to keep like monitoring the position in SERPs um, basically to, you know, keep updating your content on a regular schedule. So this is what something our growth manager is responsible for. She basically has like a, three month rotation schedule where she goes through all the posts, updates them, make sure everything is up to scratch. Um, so yeah, there have been some improvements, but essentially we're still using the, the content as it is. Now uh, we've promoted our content editor to head of content actually, so she's now responsible for running the show. We hired another full-time editor. So I have a bit more time to take care of other things. And, you know, the question here that comes logically is uh, what has been the impact of all this? Uh, scaling this whole thing uh, is, is very important. Um, but what have you seen? Obviously, you know, what you can share and feel comfortable sharing. What have you seen in terms of impact uh, uh, on a business level? Mm -hmm. Yeah, on a business level, that's, that's a very good question. Um, so we increased our SEO visibility, so the number of keywords that we rank for on the first page by over 500% after that year. Um, that translated into um, quite significant change in our revenue. I can't like reveal the exact numbers here, um, but it did have... A very significant impact. It wasn't as big as we had expected though. So at the beginning of the year, January 2021, we basically created a, a spreadsheet with like lead velocity and, you know, forecasted growth. Um, but that was unrealistic. And that was another lesson that I learned that um, the potential in your content strategy really depends on your niche. So you can have, even do simple maths, right? After downloading your keyword research from, you know, Seminar or Ahrefs, whatever you're using, just sum up all the search volumes that you have for these particular keywords. And now considering what, what's your chance of, you know, getting to the first position, looking at the keyword difficulty, like exclude all the keywords from your keyword research that you're not reasonably going to rank for um, on the first page, right? Um, just have a look at the easier ones that you can rank for and sum up that search volume and then think like, what's the chance you'll rank on the first position? Uh, maybe 20%, then, you know, divided by five. <laughs> and then consider that, you know, according to Brian Link, uh, Brian Dean of Backlinko, uh, only like, what, 48% of searches um so if people you know searching for a particular keyword actually click on the first result 
and then it declines rapidly with every position in SERPs, right? So assuming only 20% of your um, content out of this narrowed down list will land on the first position and out of that only 48% of people may click on it. What is realistically the number of website visitors, new visitors you can get to your website if all this content ranks? And I would say 20% is also super optimistic, right? Um, so yeah, this is something that we have overestimated, right? Or we were probably not realistic about the impact of the content strategy we had, and we were too impatient, so we wanted the results there and then and now. Um, we didn't factor in things like content decay, like um, hiccups with hiring rate right, and the system itself, like to Google updates that you know wiped out yep. some of our rankings for like a month in the summer so um the lesson is to be more realistic about the potential impact and not pull you know a random number out of thin air and set it as your goal because it may turn out that you will never reach it and you will just demoralize your team oh uh that was all very very insightful um Emilia, I'd like to ask you um, what's next for, for you and user pilot, if there is anything that you can share uh, that people who listen uh, to this episode uh, you know, uh, have, to, have to know. Yeah, sure. So um, user pilot continues doing what we've been doing. We're still producing 40 blogs per month and still continuing with our content strategy. But this year, as I said, I managed to promote our writer from writer to editor, from editor to head of content. So she, she made some really speedy and impressive career moves over the course of just a year, um, which gives me some time to consider other channels um, and also think about content repurposing and our distribution strategy. Because obviously we focused on publishing and content velocity last year but there is still so much potential in repurposing the content into different media and then distributing it across different channels. So I'm looking for optimal defaults, right? So little hacks that would not, you know, um, cost us a lot of effort, but that would allow us to reach broader audiences pretty much on autopilot. So these can be pre-recorded webinars that are repurposing content. This can be turning blog content into videos and embedding these videos, putting them on YouTube. This can be, you know, distributing content to Medium, for instance, which is working really well, even though at the beginning, uh, the beginnings were humble, but now we really see the impact. Um, and it doesn't cost us initially anything. It's just, you know, one click. Um, so things like that, and I'm also starting to work on a completely new channel. Um, so, so this is also exciting. Like I, I've done the last year, and I'm doing it all over again, <laughs> building systems for for a different channel this time. That's all very interesting. Thanks for sharing this, uh, Emilia. Where people can find uh, more about you and get in touch. Yeah, so LinkedIn is definitely the best place to find me. I'm hanging out there quite a lot. So uh, we'll try to respond to any messages. I get a lot of requests and messages, so it might be a bit slow. I also have like my own learning in public blog. It's very ugly, it's very old. <laughs> I just note down, you know, the systems that I'm building, building there. So if anyone's... Um, you know, interested in learning more about this particular system, it's on like DIYmarketingguide.com. We'll make sure to add that to the show notes. Uh, Emilia, thank you very much for being on the show. Thank you.